for me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the command post. You know what it is. Post up and take command. I, of course, am your set man, Louis T. And commander in chief, thank you for joining me. Today, we're talking about a number of different topics. So uh, let me apologize first and foremost for the snafu um, from the audio of the video that I released yesterday. Um, I, I didn't turn on the mic on one of the scenes and hence there was no sound for about roughly five to six minutes of the video. I sincerely apologize for that. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just go back and you know pretty much go over the things that I said yesterday quickly and then we'll get to really what I wanted to come and talk to you guys about today, which is um, this offensive coordinator search heating up for the commanders. Now, it, things were moving along slowly last week. As you would expect, they fired Scott Turner last week uh, around Tuesday, um, and then things really didn't go, you know, all that fast. You know, I think they may have been interested in, in interviewing one guy, and that was Jim Caldwell. That's all we heard last week. Things are starting to pick up now. We're getting names every single day. We got multiple names today. We'll go through those names, and I'll tell you the one that I like the best out of those names for this team um, in the interim. And so before we do that, though, let's jump into uh, the Sam Howe discussion. So Sam Howe, um, for those of you who missed this over the weekend, um, there was a, a report that sent Twitter and social media ablaze. It was all a buzz with this tweet from Jonathan Jones, who is a CBS uh, NFL insider. And so he works for CBS Sports, NFL insider. He had this scoop here that uh, essentially Washington was telling prospective offensive coordinators that we're rolling with Sam Howell, and this is the guy that you're going to be coming to Washington to coach if you should take this job. So that's news to all of us. We were not aware of the decision that they were making. I told you guys in that um, exit post-season um, presser that they sounded like they were very impressed with Sam Howell. And I told you that, you know, listening to uh, Martin Mayhew, he talked about how Sam Howell practiced and how it carried over into the game and that you don't normally see that with players. You, you want to see if the things that you've seen from, you know, Monday through Saturday transfer over to Sunday, and they got a glimpse of that. And then I think Ron was really impressed with not only how he played in the game against Dallas in week 18, but I think he was also impressed with the post-game speech he had when he got a game ball and he told the guys, let's get to work, you know, let's, let's do the things that we need to do to come back and get after it next year. And, I, and Terry McLaurin loved it. I think, Ron, you should have seen the shit-eating grin Ron had on his face as he delivered that speech. And Ron, you know, talking about that leadership quality there, really got excited. So I think they were impressed with Sam Howell. I think they um, don't think for one second that this is a done deal, right? So here's the article. If, if you want to go and read it, uh, just type in at JJ Jones or at J Jones nine and um, you, you'll find his his Twitter account. And I would assume that this story won't be too far down his timeline. Um, it's not very long. It's not a very long read. It's literally a 30 to 45 second read. Honestly, there's nothing in this article that is going to, you know, the biggest part of the article is the, the headline that the commanders are essentially informing potential offensive coordinator candidates that Sam Howell is the guy that we're thinking about running with in the upcoming season. And if you're coming to Washington, this is the guy you're probably more than likely coming to coach. Are you interested? That's the biggest takeaway from this article. Nothing else in the article is going to make you say, hmm, or it's going to be another big story. That's the headline. Okay. Now, with that said, understand that this is lying season, okay? This is lying season. I tell you this all the time. The minute the regular season ends, lying season begins for NFL teams, okay? Believe half of what you see, none of what you hear, even if it's spat by me, your man Louis T. You know the rules to the game then play, okay? Every single year you hear this, you hear that. We're not trading this guy. We're not trading that guy. We're not looking to move up in the draft and what happens? 
They trade Russell Wilson. They move up in the draft. We see these things every year. So you have to take everything that you hear with a grain of salt. Don't think for one second because this is the report right now that we're not going to pursue a veteran quarterback in free agency or via trade. Don't think for one second that they're not thinking about potentially trading up to get their hands on a quarterback that they may love. Understand that everything is done with purpose. Now, the purpose may be to start Sam Howell. Or the purpose may be to be deceptive, to make you think that they're not interested in going out and acquiring Jimmy Garoppolo, to make you think that they're not thinking about trading up to number, you know, one or two to get one of these quarterbacks in the draft. You have to also be thinking about those things. The, the, the likelihood is this is the route they're going to go. They're going to stick with Sam Howell. Here's how I feel about this. This is what I wanted all along. I told you guys. This is what I want. I don't want this regime. I don't want Martin Mayhew, Marty Herney, Ron Rivera, or anyone else in this organization at this current moment selecting another quarterback, whether it be via draft, trade, or free agency. I don't want them going out and getting anybody else. The only free agent quarterbacks that I'm interested in is if you bring Taylor Heineke back or if you go out and get a stopgap Band-Aid quarterback to back up Sam Howe like a Jacoby Brissett. That's the name that I always throw out because it's the easiest one. You know, a Tyrod Taylor type, even though I want no parts of Tyrod Taylor because he can't stay healthy. But those are the types of guys I'm interested in. Those guys aren't going to threaten Sam Howe and take his job, okay? I'm not interested in the Jimmy Garoppolo's or the Derek Carr's or any of those types of quarterbacks of the world. I'm not interested. I don't want them to be interested in those guys. I don't think you should be sold on Sam Howell. I know a lot of you are extremist, okay? You're at either one end of the spectrum or the other. You, there's no middle ground with some of you. you. You saw 19 passing attempts, which is just a sample size. I told you we got a Sam Howell sampler. There's no way you can know definitively that he's the guy. All you can do is be interested. You should be interested in seeing more, which is what I am, Okay? I can't tell you how to feel. If you want to go all in on Sam Howell, knock yourself out, okay? I hope he is the answer. But we can't know for sure with 19 passing attempts. I was intrigued by his athleticism and his ability to run. I was intrigued with his ability to throw the football accurately with zip. And I was intrigued by his ability to throw the football down the field. He was intriguing. I'd like to see more. This sounds like we're going to get that opportunity. I'm excited about that. But don't think for one second that I'm 100% sold on Sam Howell because you can't possibly be 100% sold on him after 19 snaps in the NFL. You'd be doing yourself a disservice if you're all in on Sam Howell after 19 snaps. But I am, and I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be intrigued to see more. This sounds like we're going to get that opportunity. It's the right thing to do if you ask me, but we'll see. Don't assume that this is the end all be all. That's all I'm here to tell you is don't assume that this report means they're not going to pursue veterans in free agency or via the uh, a trade, or they're not going to go after another young quarterback via the draft. That's all I'm saying. Understand what season that we're in. Okay. It could be howl season, but it's definitely lying season right now. So just wanted to make that abundantly clear. But I love the move. I hope this is the direction that they're going in. And I hope that they're telling these coordinators, hey, we're rolling with Sam Howell. Either you're in or you're out. I love it. I love it. Speaking of coordinators, let's go there. So this is the report from John Kime today. This is why I, when I speak of the offensive coordinator candidacy search heating up, this is exactly what I'm referring to. So we heard of Daryl Bevel over the weekend. I think Monday was actually when uh, Josina Anderson had the Daryl Bevel um, report. Um, but we'll see what happens with that. Uh, let's read what Kime has here for us, okay? Per source... Washington will meet with Pat Shermer. This was via Nikki Javala, okay? Offensive uh, Atlanta uh, Falcons quarterbacks coach Charles London. Others of interest, Miami 
uh, Dolphins associate head coach slash running back coach uh, Eric Studeville. All right. And then Miami pass a Dolphins passing game and slash quarterbacks coach Daryl Bevel. Okay. Others, John writes, include Caldwell, who we know is the head coaching candidate, and Frank Wright, who is also a coaching a head coaching candidate. Interviewing for head coaching jobs first, they'll wait and see on those guys. Frankly, Frank Wright is in a position where he could take a year off. He's getting paid. He doesn't have to work. We see this all the time where a guy gets fired. He wants to jump right back into the fray. If nothing comes about, he could just sit down and chill for a year, similar to Doug Peterson, right? Doug Peterson got fired from the Eagles. He said, shit, I'm still getting paid, right? Took a year off, you know, spent some time with family, got to kind of recharge the battery, jumps back in the fray, and you see what he's doing in Jacksonville. Frank Wright could do exactly that. I don't anticipate him taking an offensive coordinator job. Unless he's afraid to go home to his family every single day and not be around football, which some of these guys, they're lifers. They can't envision their life without football, and so they'd rather be in the facility grinding every single day than at home with their wife and kids or grandkids. So I, that, could, that could be Frank Wright, where he's like, you know what? I, I'd rather be doing football stuff. But if I got a free check coming my way and I can recharge the battery, I'm going home. I'm not going to be an offensive coordinator. I'll be back in the head coaching candidacy pool next year. I don't think either one of those guys are going to end up here, Caldwell or Frank Wright. So my guess is it'll be, you know, from this pool that we're swimming in with these, you know, veteran offensive play callers. And one of these names stands out among the rest. So let's go through these candidates one by one and talk about them. Okay, so let's start with John's list and we'll go in order. So Pat Shermer. Um, is the first guy that John Kahn mentions in this tweet. And he's the guy in the upper right-hand corner, okay, uh, with the Denver Broncos gear on. That was his last job. He was not in the NFL last season. Uh, took a year off. And of the four candidates, I'll just tell you, he's the one that I'm most excited about. He's the one that I want the most. Now, He's had his fair share of failures, okay, which is pretty much everybody on this list. Um, that's the nature of the NFL. You get hired, you get fired, okay? Um, unless you're on a staff with a coach that coaches in the same place for 15, 16 years, and you're comfortable and you're not looking for upward mobility, chances are you're going to get hired and fired. You're going to be moving from – that's the life of a coach. You live here for three or four years – you pack your family up, you move here for three or four more years, you pack your family up, you move this place for three or four more years, and that's how things usually go in the NFL. Pat Shermer, no different. Um, you know, was the head coach of the Cleveland Browns at one point, was the head coach of the New York Giants for a brief stint for two years, um, didn't work out in those locales, uh, was an offensive coach for the Eagles, started out as the tight ends coach, kind of matriculated his way to working with the quarterbacks. Um, had some tremendous success, and this is why I want him, okay? This is why I think he would be a great fit here in Washington. I love quarterback whisperers. That's what Doug Peterson is, which is why you're seeing the success and the uptick in production from Trevor Lawrence, because Doug Peterson is a quarterback whisperer, okay? Pat Shermer is a quarterback whisperer. He started out his career in the NFL um, with the – the Philadelphia Eagles back in 99 when they drafted Donovan McNabb. Now he was working with the tight ends. Okay. He was instrumental in the Eagles taking that next step from really good team starting to, you know, be on the cusp of doing something to exceeding that wall that was up and breaking through and getting to ultimately the Super Bowl. Now in 2002, he started working with McNabb as the quarterback's coach. That's when Donovan McNabb's career took off. He went from a you know, very mobile, you know, solid NFL passer to dynamic passer and ridiculous athlete, but really a pocket passer that can hurt you from the pocket. Um, 
that ascension started in 2002. That's when they made the NFC Championship game, I believe, three years in a row and finally broke through in 2004 when they made it to the Super Bowl and faced the Patriots. So um, I'll just say this. He had Donovan McNabb and some of the best years of McNabb's career were with Pat Shermer or at least him getting it and starting to turn that corner happened under the tutelage of Pat Shermer. He then had Sam Bradford in his rookie season. Sam Bradford, we all know, was ass in the NFL, but his rookie season was phenomenal. That rookie season came under Pat Shermer, which is what helped him land the job in Cleveland as the head coach, okay? He was phenomenal with Sam Bradford in his rookie season in uh, St. Louis with the Rams. That might have been Bradford's best year of his career. Then... He goes to uh, Philadelphia for a second stint, this time under Chip Kelly, the chipster. And he takes quarterback Nick Foles, Nicholas Foles, and churns out the best year of Foles' career as a starter. Remember that year under the chipster where Foles was 27 over 7? And everybody's like, what the hell is going on here? That was Pat Shermer as the offensive coordinator slash quarterbacks coach so he's taken quarterbacks and he's made them very successful even if only for a year we know he's capable I think he's actually a bright offensive mind I don't think he's a head coach which I think we've seen that movie played out multiple times we're not asking him to be a head coach here we're asking him to be the offensive coordinator I think he can do a very good job and the thing that I would be most excited about is he would be getting his hands on a second-year quarterback that is very impressionable, that I think he would be able to help shape and mold into a big-time NFL um, quarterback. So that's what I would be most intrigued by. Pat Shermer would be number one on my list of these candidates that they've um, released to the media as guys that they were looking to interview. The next name on the list is Atlanta Falcons quarterbacks coach Charles London. Of all the names... He's the one that really, truly doesn't fit. Now, he's right under Pat Shermer in that um, thumbnail that you see right at the bottom right-hand corner. Um, He's interesting. So this is a guy that really... Now, in this regard, he does fit. He is, has been, really, a running backs coach his entire career. Now, he was a quarterbacks coach for the Falcons last year, which, what does that mean? We saw the Falcons firsthand. Marcus Mariota was like a running back, okay? That, you know, occasionally threw the football, but he was essentially a running back. So I, I don't really know what to make of him being a quarterback's coach. I know he's a running back's coach. That's what he's been for the life of his career for the most part. And what did I tell you about one of the candidates that I threw out in Anthony Lynn? Running back's coach, a career running back's coach. They talked about wanting to run the football. They talked about wanting to be physical. So think running backs, coach. When you think about physicality, wanting to run the football, you know, wanting to protect your young quarterback, think of guys like Anthony Lynn. Think of guys like Charles London, even um, Eric Studeville, who we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, These are the types of names that should come to mind when you're thinking about being physical, wanting to run the football, wanting to establish the run. Um, I don't think they're going to do the two to one, you know, run to pass ratio. But if they're thinking about leaning towards that direction, these are the kinds of guys that would make a ton of sense, which is what we are trying to steer clear of. I think, though, what was very intriguing or what is very intriguing, rather, with Charles London is we watched the Falcons up close and personal. They gashed us in the run game. And these were massive holes and we were confused and we didn't know what the hell was coming. If he's a part of that, which he is, then you would love nothing more than to pick his brain and to see where he is. And you may think to yourself, this guy's ultra impressive. And he's got some concepts that we've never thought of. And they may actually be able to take this offense and elevate it because the Falcons were a tough team to deal with. They just didn't have enough talent. So he's interesting I don't necessarily know if I love it because I'm more concerned with the quarterback, less concerned with the run game. Now, it'll be interesting to see what type of run game the new offensive coordinator 
will deploy because for years here in Washington, our run game has been trash and it hasn't really married up well with the play action fake game, right? Our run game hasn't been a good package with the run action fakes. And in order to have successful play action, it needs to look like your run game. I thought towards the end of last season, that was the first time where the run game and the play action fake game and the run action fake game actually started to marry with one another because we were going under center. It was these long developing runs with pullers and you know counters and wham blocks, things of that nature. And we started to do heavy play action fakes with you know long seven step drops and things of that nature. Um, maybe Charles London's offensive background, especially last year with Atlanta, where they were so diverse running the football with their quarterbacks, running backs. Uh, they had three different running you know runners last year over 500 yards rushing. Maybe they're interested in that. We'll see. He sticks out like a sore thumb amongst this group here. Miami associate head coach slash running backs coach Eric Studeville, to me, is a running back coach lifer, okay? He's on par with Anthony Lynn. You know, one of these guys that you're super impressed with, he's got a long history of being in the league as a running backs coach, helping shape and mold run games that have been successful throughout the NFL over the last decade plus, and so just off the strength of that, you'd like to see where this guy is mentally. Is he ready to be a play caller for the first time in his career? You know, that's the kind of thing that you just want to sit down with the guy and kind of see where he is. But he fits the Anthony Lynn mold of, hey, you know, when you got a conservative head coach, which Ron Rivera is, okay, I've had people try to, you know, hit me up and say, Ron Rivera is not as conservative as you think. Ron has always been and always will be conservative. He will air it out. When the time comes, same thing I said about Anthony Lynn, you'll take your shots when they um, appear, when those opportunities present themselves. But make no mistake about it, Ron Rivera has always been a guy that errs on the side of caution. That one year in 2015 is an anomaly. It is not who he has been throughout his entire career. He is a run first head coach. That is usually the case with defensive minded head coaches. You look across the board. These guys generally ask the offense to just stay out of the way, not turn it over, and the defense will give us a chance. We saw Todd Bowles. We saw how conservative he is. He's from that same era of football as Ron Rivera. He's from that same mindset of, hey, let's punt the football. Now, Ron is a little bit more aggressive in, in certain situations. He'll roll the dice. I think analytics have influenced him a little bit more than a guy like Todd Bowles, who seems to be very rigid and stuck in his ways. Ron will roll the dice from time to time. But we saw Ron bitch up in the most important game of the season against the Giants and, and go back to his conservative nature where he's playing field position. He wants to punt at the Giants, you know, 44-yard line instead of going for it on a fourth and short or fourth and medium. And so we saw that conservative nature rear its ugly head. That's who he is at its core. You know, when things get tough, we revert. We're humans. We revert back to our tendencies our habits, the things that make us comfortable. We saw that in the game against the Giants. So understand that Ron Rivera would rather run the football, not turn it over, punt if he has to, okay, and be conservative and give his defense a chance because we saw how Ron got a hard on when he starts talking about winning 17 to 15 and 17 to 16. You saw how excited and giddy Ron got when we were winning games by running the football, being physical, not turning it over, and finding a way to get it done defensively. You saw how excited he got. Well, guys like Eric Studeville and Charles London and Anthony Lynn, if, if they decide to go you know, that route, they fit that narrative. So I'm not surprised by a guy like Eric Studeville. Miami Dolphins passing game uh, uh, slash quarterback coach Daryl Bevel is the name that really stood out on Monday that got a lot of people talking. And I'm just here to tell you, I want no parts of Daryl Bevel. All right. He's a guy that has been an offensive coordinator at least four to five times in this league, uh, which look, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a guy that kills 
people for getting fired. And his situation has been really unique because he's been in two different spots where the offensive coordinator uh, has gotten fired um, or the head coach has gotten fired, and he's been promoted to interim head coach. And generally, you're dead man walking once that happens. You're coaching out the rest of the season, and then a new staff is going to come in and out with the old staff. So sometimes it's not even your fault that you get fired. It's just, hey, your coach got – the guy that hired you got fired, and now everybody's got to go. But this is the thing about Daryl Bevel that I, I really am not a big fan of. Um, he's He fits – first of all, he fits the mold of what – I've been talking about veteran play caller with a run first background. And, you know, he was in Seattle for a number of years with Russell Wilson. This is all I really need to say to you. If you need help understanding why he's not a good fit here, we just left an offensive coordinator where we bitched and complained about situational awareness. This is the coordinator, Daryl Bevel's claim to fame, or really, this is probably more he's notorious for, okay, because this isn't a good thing. This He is notoriously known for being the guy that decided that the Seattle Seahawks should throw the football from the one-yard line instead of giving it to Marshawn Lynch for an easy walk-in touchdown that would have beaten the New England Patriots and given the Seattle Seahawks back-to-back Super Bowl championships. He was the guy that had the genius idea to throw a slant at the one-yard line. Okay, so if you need to know nothing else, we were just so frustrated with dumb, dumb decisions in short yardage and, you know, not having situational awareness. That's not having situational awareness at its highest peak, okay, That is the worst situational awareness possibly in NFL history because you're talking about winning a Super Bowl if you just turn around and hand it to one of the most violent and physical runners in NFL history. One yard is all you need. And they decide to throw the football and it gets picked off. Daryl Bevel made that decision. Do you want that here in Washington? Do you want a guy that on third and one is going to say, you know what, Brian Robinson, we know you're going to get this first down. But instead, we're going to have Sam Howell drop back and throw a a, a slant that may get picked off or batted down on the ground. Do you want that on fourth and one? Guy that decides to get extremely cute instead of doing the thing. He wants to run the football, okay? Wants to run the hell out of the football. But then when it comes time to run it, when he should run it, he doesn't run it. Is that what you want? Because we just had a guy that didn't understand that concept. Now, he's going to do all the things that Ron wants him to do. He's going to run the football. He's going to be very conservative. He'll give he'll give us a chance. But he's going to drive you nuts with some of his decision making. I'm not interested. I've seen this movie before. I'm not looking to be kind, and I'm not looking to rewind. I'm good. So you can go right ahead on Daryl Bevel. Knock yourself out, okay? I'm going to go over here and look at Pat Shermer. That's who I'm looking at and saying, hey, if we're going to go with one of these veteran retreads, which is the the route that we're more likely going to go, if we're going to go with one of these veteran retreads, sign me up for Pat Shermer, okay? Bevel has not interviewed yet. We're not sure, as you see, John Kime says, not sure if Bevel will eventually interview here or not. Another possible wait and see, depending on how coaching dominoes fall. Sounds like this will be a patient process. So things are heating up, but there may not be a decision on this. They don't have to rush. We're not playing a football game for another six months. They don't have to rush, okay? So, um, or we're probably not playing a football game for another seven months. They don't have to rush. They can take their time, and we want them to get this right. If you are a Ron Rivera hater and you want him fired, then you could care less. You want him to get this wrong. The, the, the sooner, the better. The sooner he fails, the, the faster he's out of here, the better it is for you if you want him gone. I'm not looking for Ron to fail. After watching the playoffs over this weekend and watching the Giants succeed, watching the Cowboys succeed, and the Eagles had a bye week, and we've got three out of four teams in the division in the divisional round, I want success now. I want that shit like yesterday. 
I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of being at the bottom of the barrel in the division. And now it's to the point where the Giants, they've turned their shit around and they're not going back to the bottom with us. Either we elevate our shit or we're down there by ourselves, echoing with nobody hearing us. So again, I can't tell you how to feel. You could want Ron out of here. That's fine. I want to win, damn it. That's never changed for me. I want to win. And so, to me, Pat Shermer is the quickest path to doing that, which is why I want them to go in that direction. But we'll see what they decide to do. Anyway, I'll keep you abreast of everything that's going on, any changes that happen, any more names that may arise. I'll have it covered here. All right? You know what it is. I told you. I got y'all. So, with that said, we will be live on Thursday night for the Command Post Live. So we'll have plenty to talk about. We'll see if any more candidates arise uh, in this process, if they have interviewed some guys, and, and we'll talk about you know everything under the sun with this team, the division. Uh, look, there's going to be an NFC East team in the NFC Championship game. That shit makes me sick to my stomach. There's a chance in a very realistic possibility that we could have an all NFC East NFC championship game. That's scary. And we're not a part of it. Let that shit sink in. I'm your man, Louis T signing off again. I appreciate you for joining me. You know what it is. Post up, take command until next time. You guys, Have a good one. See you next time. Louis T. Network.